Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, my father, Mitch Paqua, and welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we bring you the writings of Pope John Paul the Great. Before we get to the document we're looking at, Vita Consecrata, let's take a look at some of your emails. Remember, you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Threshold at EWTN.com. First email. Dear Father Mitch, my husband and I are both Protestant, though we are seriously considering joining the Catholic Church. We are wondering, though, what the conversion process would look like. Would we need to take classes on the catechism first? Would we need to be baptized again? Typical Baptist, we've already been baptized twice. And what would the first confession look like with 25 to 27 years of unconfessed sin, most of, most of which we've surely forgotten? What resources might be available to help ease the transition to full communion with the church? Carissa. Well, Carissa, uh, first of all, welcome. And one of the resources that we have are the classes that there's a process of going to your local parish and asking to, to be part of the class. Now, they've already started. Usually they begin in September and go until Easter. And it's, we want to make sure that somebody who enters the church knows what we believe and has a good understanding, a good foothold on what the doctrines of the church are. So that you're not coming into it blind or not, you're not blindsided by some, some doctrine that you didn't say, wait a minute, I didn't know that this was a Catholic doctrine. No, we want you to know what we believe. And it's based on the catechism. And that would be the first step. And it's also part of a process of introducing you to the liturgy and to becoming part of the, the faith. Now, there are a number of resources available. Uh, uh, you, you would not need to be baptized again. You've already been baptized, as you say, twice already. Uh, the first baptism we count as counting. So, you know, as long as you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, as a Trinitarian baptism, we accept it but you would need to be received into the church, and that would include an act of faith in what the Catholic Church believes. So that's, that's why we want you to study what we believe before you make that act of faith, so that it's done in good conscience. And uh, the confession would look like uh, a Catholic confession. <laughs> you know, what you would be able to do is an examination of conscience. Matter of fact, if it's helpful to you, I've got a book called Go in Peace. And it's, uh, you can get it from EWTN's Religious Catalog. And in the book, uh, and, and if they're out of them, you can go to my website, fathermispackwood.org. Um, but in the book, it goes through the, the sacrament of confession, some of the common understandings and some of the misunderstandings. And it also gives an examination of conscience so you can go over your past life and check off you know, some of the sins. And you don't have to go through every single case. You might say, over the last 27 years, I've uh, robbed 50 banks. Uh, I've uh, stolen money from 100 uh, uh, retail stores or whatever. You no, know, whatever it might be. Uh, you don't have to you just give the, the, the number in general. And that would be the, the, your confession. So, but that would, you, you would get preparation for that. And studying the catechism and going over the catechism would be a, a good thing to do to find out what the various... Because one section of the, of the uh, catechism is going over the Ten Commandments and understanding the ramifications of each commandment and what it means in terms of various other related sins. So that would be the process. And hopefully you'll enjoy that process as well. Many, most of the people I know who have undergone it have enjoyed it. Another email. Dear Father Mitch, why did the Roman Catholic change the date of the Feast of Epiphany from the traditional date of January 6th to the Sunday that falls between January 2nd and January 8th? January 6th is the 12th day of Christmas, and it's been the Feast of the Epiphany, known as Three Kings Day, for hundreds of years. And I can't think of any good reason to break with that tradition. Jim in Alexandria, Virginia. Well, Jim, that's one of the things that goes on in the Roman Rite, but in many of the other rites, they still celebrate it on January 6th. And the reason that they switched it to a Sunday is because it's such an important feast, they want to make sure that Catholics get to Mass on the Epiphany. 
So to make sure that they're there, they, there's less, since it's not a holy day of obligation, the, a lot of Catholics would miss the Epiphany if it were during the weekdays. So to make sure that everybody celebrates the feast, they celebrate it on a Sunday, and that's the reason why. It's very simple. All right. Well, we are in the document known as Vita Consecrata. And this document can be found on our website. You can go to get a free electronic copy by going to EWTN.com. When you get to the website, go to the television tab and then click that and then click television series at the television tab. Scroll down to Threshold of Hope and click there and you'll see that the document is linked on the Threshold of Hope links on that page. And you can download it into your computer for free. Uh, if you print it out, you have to pay for your own paper and ink. All right. We are on paragraph 71, which is discussing the dimensions of continuing formation. Remember last week we were talking about continuing formation because there's no point at which you're finished with your formation until the day you die. And that's the last stage of formation when you're in the process of dying. Now, if the subject of formation is the individual at every stage of life, and by subject, he means the one who is doing the continuing formation. He uses subject in a philosophical way, and it refers to the person who is the actor or the subject of the sentence. In this case, the sentence is the one who does continuing education, and the subject of that is the person at every stage of life. The object of formation is the whole person who is called to seek and love God with all one's heart, with all one's soul, and all one's might. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, where the great commandment of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is the, the great commandment. And Jesus um, bring, uh, also pulls together the other great commandment from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So loving your neighbor as yourself is the second great commandment. And Jesus brings that together in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, as well as in the Gospels of Luke and in uh, uh, Mark. Now, love of God and love of the brethren is a powerful force which can ceaselessly inspire the process of growth and fidelity. So, in order to keep growing, you need a motive. What's going to be the motive? Well, love of God and love of neighbor. That's going to be the motive that keeps you inspired and keeps you motivated to, to continue to study. Because you realize the more you love God and the more you love your neighbor, you also realize how little you still know, how little that you're, you understand things, and you need something to go beyond that. Life in the Spirit is clearly of primary importance. Living in the Spirit, consecrated persons discover their own identity and find profound peace. This living in the Spirit is something that is a living in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a human force. The Holy Spirit is God who comes to stir within our hearts. And this is something that is very important. You can find, though, who you are in relationship to the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't really find our identity on our own. We need to be in relationship in order to find our identity, to find out who we really are. And that's a very important point. It's, you know, something that we can also discover not only in our relationship to other people whom we love as ourselves, but in loving God 
And the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to know more of our identity as well as to find a profound peace. See, that's one of the goals of finding your own identity is to have a deep peace within you. And that's, that's one of the things that will also come from living a life of the Spirit. They grow more attentive to the daily challenges of the Word of God. And they allow themselves to be guided by the original inspiration of their institute. Now, this is going to be a very important point that he'll make, that fidelity to the Word of God is going to be key, as well as to the charism of the order to which you belong. Now, in terms of fidelity to the Word of God, that is also going to be part of living the life in the Spirit. Why? Think about it. Who inspired the Word of God? Don't we say in the creed every Sunday, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son, He's worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets that the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. And to live a life of the Spirit means that you're going to go back into Scripture more deeply and allow the same Holy Spirit who inspired Scripture to stir within you as well and to inspire you to understand the Scripture He inspired. That's one of the things that we, we, we see. But also, the original inspiration of the Institute, that is, of the, of the religious order, that following that original charism, is going to be part of following the Spirit because the Holy Spirit gave that charism to the founder and it was passed on to the rest of the order. Under the action of the Spirit, they resolutely keep times for prayer, silence, and solitude. And they never cease to ask the Almighty for the gift of wisdom in the struggles of everyday life. Notice some of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. First of all, prayer. Making sure that there's time alone with God. And it's going to be in silence. There needs to be a silence. There's, there's time for communal prayer, to be sure. And many religious will say the office together. But there also has to be a time for quiet prayer, silent prayer. And solitude, where you are alone to think things through. And with that being alone can come the gift of wisdom. In the book of wisdom, chapter 9, verse 9 through 10, it says, with thee is wisdom, who knows thy works, and was present when thou didst make the world, and who understand what is pleasing in thy sight, and what is right according to thy commandments. Send her forth from the holy heavens, and from the throne of thy glory send her, that she may be with me in toil, that I may learn what is pleasing to thee. Wisdom is what teaches us what is pleasing to God. Because wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. Knowledge is acquiring facts and information. Wisdom is being able to reflect on that knowledge reflect on those facts and make sense out of life because of it. That's what wisdom does. It helps us to make sense of life. And that's one of the things that comes from solitude and quiet and prayer. Another element is that the human and fraternal dimensions of the consecrated life call for self-knowledge and awareness of personal limitations. So in consecrated life, you've got human dimensions where you are related to other people. It's not only the spiritual life. It's a human life. You're living in a community usually. And there are fraternal dimensions that you have to deal with the other brothers and sisters. But in order to deal with them, you have to have self-knowledge because people will see your weaknesses they will see your foibles better than you can see them. And they will point them out. Now, doesn't that go on in marriage, too? 
in marriage, you also are living with somebody else who can see your foibles, your weaknesses, your limitations. Oftentimes they see them better than we see them ourselves. And that's why it's very important for us to have self-knowledge so that when somebody does critique us, we recognize and say, you know, you're right. I do that. I don't intend to, but I'm sort of caught in some compulsions and I don't know how not to do it. So I'm stuck in that a bit and I need help to get out of it. That's where awarenesses of personal limitations come in. So as to offer its members the inspiration and support needed on the path toward perfect freedom. That a perfect freedom is not a freedom from all restraint. That's not perfect freedom. Perfect freedom is a perfect equal-mindedness in which you look upon all different things as equal and say, look, I only want to choose what God wants me to choose. That's where real freedom lies. And I can give up things that God doesn't want me to do. And so that's one of the things that we should have a, a good sense of. In present day circumstances, special importance must be given to the interior freedom of consecrated persons. Again, that freedom on the inside to be able to say, you know, I am willing to choose whatever God wants me to choose. I'm willing to choose whatever God sets before me. And I can leave something behind, a job that I love, or I can accept it. I can do whatever God wants, and he's going to speak to my superiors, and I'm going to trust in them. That's a perfect interior freedom. Also, their affective maturity, that is their emotional maturity, so that your emotions are proper to the situations. We all are going to have emotions. We won't be emotionless, but they should be appropriate to the situation in which we find ourselves. Also, their ability to communicate with others, especially in their own community, that the ability to talk about what's going on and to be honest in a conversation, that's a very important element. And the serenity of spirit, so that you have a peacefulness and serenity, that's, that's a no small gift. And it takes wisdom to be able to have serenity, to say, look, it doesn't matter what goes on here. I can take it or leave it. You know, but it's serenity is, is a gift. And also compassion for those who are suffering. Not the attitude, boy, I'm glad it was them and not me. Hopefully we won't have that attitude. But rather, you know, an understanding of what somebody else's suffering would be like and putting ourselves into their mindset or as they sometimes say, put ourselves in their shoes as they're going through suffering and try to have compassion for them who are suffering. Also, they should be known for their love for truth. That the truth, even when it's difficult, is something that you love simply because it's true, especially when it comes to the faith. We don't choose the elements of the faith that we like just because it's convenient. We don't get to choose the commandments I like because some are easier for me than others, but rather we seek the truth because of its own sake. And a correspondence between the actions and words so that what you say goes along with what you do. And the two go together. Now these are gifts that should belong to everybody. But he's highlighting that these are gifts that should belong to the consecrated religious as well. Now the apostolic dimension opens the hearts and minds of consecrated persons and prepares them for constant effort in the apostolate. Remember the apostolate comes from the word in Greek, Apostolain, which means to be sent out. An apostolate means that you are sent out to be on a mission for Christ. Mission is the Latin word. Apostolate is a Greek root. But they both mean the same thing, to be sent out to do something for Christ. 
And the apostle usually refers to the different ways in which somebody works for the Lord. So the apostolate of a parish priest is his parish. The apostolate of a teaching sister is her school. The apostolate of a missionary is the mission. You know, the, and, and say in a foreign country or a home mission. So there's going to be constant effort in the apostolate. And having an apostolic dimension opens your mind up and your heart to say, look, I've got to be about this work. That's the thing that I'm supposed to be doing here. And that this is the sign that it is the love of Christ that urges them on. That's something that St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. The love of God urges us on. Uh, and uh, we're, the love of Christ controls us because we're convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And so that urging on of the love of Christ is something that drives us in the apostolate. In practice, this will involve updating methods and objectives of apostolic works because, you know, you don't want to be in a rut. That's going to be part of this continuing education that the apostolate is not meant to be a rut in which you just do the same thing every year. You pull out the same old notes if you're a teacher. That's one of the reasons I had to stop teaching as a professor because doing the work here at EWTN plus preparing my class notes just didn't go together. I had to prepare one or the other and I couldn't prepare both. So I had to let go of the classroom because I don't want to just use the same old notes year after year. I wanted to keep on developing my lectures, and there needs to be ongoing education and learning greater depth about the subjects you're teaching or whatever else your apostolate might be. If you're a medical uh, apostolate, you have to keep updating on medicine. And you also update not only the methods and the objectives, but you do so in fidelity to the spirit and names of the founder or the founders of your order. What was the goal of the order? If you're a teaching order of nuns, then it's to be able to teach. If it's grammar school or high school or whatever kind of education that they have to do. Some colleges and so on. And to subsequently emerging traditions. Because sometimes, for instance, the Jesuits, my order was not, uh, we were not founded to be a teaching order. But as time went on, teaching became the main thing that we did. Uh, one of the main apostolates, along with the missions. And, and so that's one of the later traditions that developed and became extremely important. With continuous attention to changing historical and cultural conditions at the general and local levels where the apostolates carried out, so that there's going to be changing conditions in the place where you work. And that's going to be one of the things that you have to pay attention to. You know, high school teaching, when I started in the 1970s, is not what it is today. It's a different, different uh, mindset. As a matter of fact, it's less rebellious than it was when I was a teacher. And so it's, it's in some ways the teachers who've been teaching all these years say that it's easier now because the kids are more willing to learn than they were in the early 70s when I started teaching. And so the, you, you adapt to the changing historical circumstance. Also, continuing education is going to deal with the cultural and professional dimensions. First, that has to be based on a solid theological training. There's a theology that you have to have to be able to understand what's going on and why you're doing something. That's the basis for all wise discernment. If you're discerning God's will, you have to know about God. And that's what theology is. Theology is the study of God. And so that's going to be a very basic thing. And there needs to be continual updating and special interest in the different areas to which each charism is directed. So the teaching orders will expect to have updating as teachers and so on. And the same thing in the medical and the missions and the rest. Consecrated persons must keep themselves as intellectually open and adaptable as possible. 
so that the apostle will be envisaged and carried out according to the needs of, our own, of their own time, making use of the means by cultural progress. So that's going to be one of the elements of what's going on in, in professional updating and professional ongoing education. Finally, all these elements are united in the dimension of the charism proper to each institute. So our, my charism is as a Jesuit. And that charism has to unite all of these different elements of continuing education. He keeps on going back to how important it is for the order to go back to its original charism. That's key. Because it's a synthesis, a, a pulling together, which calls for a constant deepening of one's own special consecration in all its aspects. Not only apostolic, but also ascetical and mystical. So that there's going to be a, an, a, an aspect of ascetical theology, which is the discipline of religious life, as well as mystical theology, the aspect of prayer and the theology of prayer. This means that each member should study diligently the spirit, history, and mission of the institute to which he or she belongs in order to advance the personal and communal assimilation of its charism so that the goal is to keep on studying the meaning of the charism. You don't stop when you're a novice. That's one of the temptations, to stop when you're a novice and figure, well, there's not much else I can learn. There's always more to learn. Not in terms of just knowledge, but what we were saying before about learning a wisdom, a wisdom of how to live out the vocation. And in a document called Potissimum Institutioni, paragraph 68, the Pope cites this and says, continued formation should be carried out, taking into account the fact that its different aspects are separable from and mutually influential in the life of each religious and each community, especially keeping in mind fidelity to the charism of one's institute, to an ever-increasing knowledge of its founder, its history, its spirit, its mission, and a correlative effort to live this charism personally and in community, so that the person will have this understanding to affect themselves personally, but also to make sure that they affect the community. And it's going to be both sides of learning the charism of the order that will help in the renewal of the order. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and continue on with this document, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We want to invite you to come here and join us if you get a chance. You might want to wait until the snow goes away. We had some snow and ice storms here, as you probably have heard. And, you know, the, it, it, we, we don't have a live studio audience, to, a very large one anyway today, just a very small one today, because not many people were able to get here. But we would love to have you come here as soon as it melts. As a matter of fact, it's already pretty well melting away. And if you get a chance to come and join us, please call our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll help you with scheduling of programs and where you can be in the audience, as well as uh, tours of the network, and most importantly, the masses, both here at EWTN and over in Hansville. All right, since our audience is so small, we're going to do one more email. Uh, Dear Father Pacwa, I'm in dialogue with a Protestant friend of mine who is thinking of becoming Catholic. Even Although she has accepted many doctrines held by the church, one thing she can't understand or accept is self-mortification. Is there a scriptural basis for it? 
I've tried to defend it by showing how saints have conquered great obstacles through self-mortification, such as St. John Vianney converting the town of Arles, Ars by flailing himself every night. This has been very unsuccessful. My friend states that self-mortification belittles Christ's suffering for us. If Christ suffered and died for us, why should we cause ourselves suffering? Aren't his wounds good enough? How do we explain this holy practice to our non-Catholic brothers and sisters? And more importantly, how is self-mortification different from masochism? Michael from Pittsburgh. Great question. Great question. One, in terms of scriptural basis, there are a number of bases. One of them is that Christ said, unless you pick up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. It's very important to keep in mind that Jesus carried the cross, but he calls us to carry the cross too. Now, his death on the cross is the death of infinite God, and it has infinite value. But he also desires us to unite ourselves to his suffering, and we do so by joining our sufferings to his. Now, this is both in terms of the sufferings that we undergo unwillingly. You know, there's some things that happen to us where we're more passive, say a sickness or the horrible tragedy that happened recently in Arizona where people were shot. That suffering and the mourning and grief that, that it causes is something that you suffer passively. You didn't do it. You're not the perpetrator of it. But on the other hand, there, you can choose to engage in suffering. And this is something Jesus said that we could do. Remember he said that uh, when the Pharisees asked <clears throat> why his disciples did not fast, like John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, he said they can't fast while the bridegroom is with them. But when the bridegroom is gone, then they'll fast. So this time of Christ's ascension into heaven, when Christ is present in heaven, is spiritually present with us, but not physically present. This is a time for us to also pray and fast. And so that's another basis for it. And the early church fasted. For instance, before St. Paul was sent off on his first mission, he fasted. And that was a very important element for him. And so uh, not only he, but the whole church fasted with him. And then they sent him off onto the mission to go to Antioch and other places, um, Cyprus. So you see this background in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, that praying and fasting are things that God accepts from us as small little gifts. A final little way to understand it I like to use is that it's like the Mother's Day gifts the little children give their moms. Now, those little presents are usually handmade. <laughs> They're not necessarily going to ever be in the Louvre. There won't be works of art that people will pay to come see. But they do end up on the refrigerated door and are considered very precious. Now, do they make up for all that mom has ever done for a kid? No. What mom does for the children is way more than they can ever do. But the children are, you know, give their parents a little delight by giving that small gift. And moms cherish that, especially in moments when they're not being quite so generous and good. And so to have those little gifts is a very important thing, even though it doesn't make up for all that mother has ever done for the children. So also Christ's suffering for us have as infinite value, but he accepts our little gift as something given to him and he cherishes it the way a mom or a dad cherishes a little gift from their little child. And that's another way to see it as well. Hopefully that'll be helpful to you. Okay. Now we are beginning chapter three of this document. 
Servitium caritatis, the service of charity, is what that means. And it's subtitled, Consecrated Life, Manifestation of God's Love in the World. That's going to be its, its subtitle, Manifestation of God's Love in the World. So we begin on paragraph 72, which is entitled, Consecrated for Mission. First of all, religious are to be in the image of Jesus, the beloved Son, whom, as Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 34 to 36, is that the, whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world. This is Jesus that the Father has consecrated and sent into the world. And especially in verse 36. And in this, those whom God calls to follow Jesus are also consecrated and sent into the world to imitate his example and to continue his mission. So this is something that we see as a key starting point, that those who are in the apostolic orders especially, but all religious, including the contemplatives, are consecrated and sent into the world because Jesus was consecrated. Fundamentally, this is true of every disciple. So not only religious, but every married person is consecrated by their marriage. Every Christian is consecrated by their baptism and confirmation. And so this is going to be a very important element uh, for every disciple to be consecrated. In a special way, however, it is true of those who in the manner that characterizes consecrated life are called to follow Christ more closely. They're supposed to follow Christ and, and make him the all of their lives so that no one else is more important than Christ for the religious. And that's one of the things that he does, that he mentions here. The task of devoting themselves Holy to mission is therefore included in their call. That's a key element of their work. They're devoted wholly to the mission, completely, entirely to the mission. Whereas a married person is consecrated to the mission of the family. The religious doesn't have his or her own family and is entirely dedicated to the mission. A, a husband and wife should not be as dedicated to their job as they are to their family. Whereas a religious can have a dedication to the apostolate that's different than you would have in the dedication of a family. Indeed, by the action of the Holy Spirit, who is at the origin of every vocation and charism, consecrated life is itself a mission that it's going to be a mission just by its very nature because the whole life of Jesus was a mission. And it's not just when he healed somebody that he was on mission. It's not just when he was preaching in the synagogues or multiplying the loaves and fish or doing some other miracle. That wasn't the, the limit of his mission. His very life was to be a mission, and that's to be the case for the consecrated as well. The profession of the evangelical councils, which makes a person totally free for the service of the gospel, is important also from this point of view. So that having these, remember, remember what these uh, evangelical councils are. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Three councils from the gospel, that's what they call evangelical, they come from the gospel. That Jesus was poor, Jesus was obedient, Jesus was chaste. And as such, this, these three evangelical councils on religious life are setting somebody free for the service of the gospel. That you don't have to worry. I, I don't have to worry about a family. There'd be a lot of things I could not do if I had to think twice about my family. And I would, I would limit what I do apostolically because I would have obligations to a family. 
whereas a religious does not have that obligation. And that's, in that sense, you're set free for the service of the gospel. It can therefore be said that a sense of mission is essential to every institute, not only those in the active apostolic life, but also the contemplative life. So every religious institute, every religious order has as its very nature mission or apostolate, even if it's the apostolate of prayer, like the contemplatives do. They, have, they spend their days in prayer rather than in doing work. Well, they work, but they don't have the same apostolic mission that, say, I would have by working here at EWTN or when I was a teacher. They have the apostolic mission of being in prayer for the sake of the rest of the church. Indeed, more than in external works, the mission consists in making Christ present to the world through personal witness. Now remember, if Jesus' whole life was his mission, then it was everything that he did and his whole way of being that was his mission. The same should also be the case for religious. Their whole way of life should be their mission. And they give a personal witness to what they do and why they do it. This is the challenge. This is the primary task of consecrated life, to make it a personal testimony to Jesus. The more consecrated persons allow themselves to be conformed to Christ, the more Christ is made present and active in the world for the salvation of all. Now, the prior issue is that the religious, like every Christian, must be more and more conformed to Christ. We must act and think like Jesus and love like Jesus. This is key. And the more they're conformed to Jesus, the more they act like him, the more that they think like him and love like him, the more they can make him present. And when Jesus is present, it's so that people can be saved from sin, saved for heaven and from hell. That's the task that's at, at stake. Thus it can be said that consecrated persons are in mission by virtue of their very consecration. So that just by the fact that you've taken your vows, you are on mission. And that's going to be part of the, the, the task. A consecration to which they bear witness in accordance with the ideal of their institute. So that the Carmelites will show their consecration according to the rule of Carmel. And the Benedictines according to the rule of St. Benedict. And the Jesuits according to their constitution. And Franciscans according and Dominicans according to theirs to their rules. When the founding charism provides for pastoral activities, it is obvious that the witness of life and the witness of works of the apostolate and human development are equally necessary. So some charism, some religious orders, provide for apostolic work. Again, like Jesuits, Divine Word Fathers, Dominicans, and many Franciscans, most Franciscans, they have an apostolate. And when they have pastoral activities, especially in you know, working in parishes and hospitals, it is obvious that the witness of life and the witness of works of the apostolate and human development are equally necessary. So that it's not only going to be the actual labor that you do in, say, a parish, but it's also the religious own human development, their maturity, their growing in wisdom that we talked about uh, earlier th th in this show. All of that is going to be just as much part of the apostolate as is the actual works that they do. Both the apostolate and human development mirror Christ who is at one and the same time consecrated to the glory of the Father and sent into the world for the salvation of his brothers and sisters. Now, Christ, 
is consecrated for the glory of the Father. And this is going to be who he is. That's about his very identity. He's also sent into the world for the salvation of his brothers and sisters, and that's what he does. So both who he is and what he does. Jesus is uh, somebody who is, who is there for us, and we should mirror Jesus. Now, he makes a footnote here to Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph 46, where it says in Lumen Gentium, which is the constitution on the church in the modern world, that religious should carefully keep before their minds the fact that the church presents Christ to believers and non-believers alike in a striking manner daily through them, that is, through the religious. The church thus portrays Christ in contemplation on the mountain, in his proclamation of the kingdom of God to the multitudes, in his healing of the sick and maimed, in his work of converting sinners to a better life, in his solicitude for youth, and his goodness to all men, always obedient to the will of the Father who sent him. Religious life, moreover, continues the mission of Christ with another feature, specifically its own, fraternal life and community for the sake of the mission. Because religious don't, always, don't only think in terms of you know, their own individual life, but religious also have a communal life and that they live in community for the most part. Sometimes they're separated from community for different reasons, but fraternal life is still part of them even when they're living alone, as many who live in parishes are, have to do. And so, thus, men and women religious will be all the more committed to the apostolate, the more personal their dedication to the Lord Jesus is, the more fraternal their community life, and the more ardent their involvement in the Institute's specific mission. So the three things that you look for, that he wants us to look for, is, first of all, personal dedication to the Lord Jesus. Jesus has to be the center. He must be the very center. Second, fraternal community life, so that there is a, de a rich development of the community. And third, ardent involvement in the mission and that they're really committed to doing the service that the order was founded to do. Now, paragraph 73, which is entitled, At the Service of God and Humanity. He begins, The consecrated life has the prophetic task of recalling and serving the divine plan for humanity, as it is announced in Scripture and as it emerges from an attentive reading of the signs of God's providential action in history. So, there's a prophetic task that has two parts to it. Recalling the divine plan for humanity in Scripture. Scripture lays out what God's plan is for us. To come to Jesus. To join His church. To receive His sacraments. To have this life of grace to live a life of the Holy Spirit. All of these things are laid out in sacred scripture. But the second way in which the consecrated life recalls the plan for humanity is by looking for the signs of God's providence in human history. In everyday life, God is active. And it's very important to see how God is active. What is the Lord saying in various things? And what is what's the human element saying? And how do we distinguish the two? This is the plan for salvation and reconciliation of humanity. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, St. Paul writes, If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations that do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things which all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and doctrines? He's saying not to do that. 
Uh, and so, so you have to follow God's plan and not a human plan. Also, to carry out this service appropriately, consecrated persons must have a profound experience of God and be aware of the challenge of their time. This is going to be a key element. Having a personal relationship with God, but at the same time that you're in contact with God, you're aware of the challenges of the time, understanding the profound theological meaning of these challenges through discernment made by the help of the Holy Spirit. We have to pay attention to what's going on in the world, what's happening in the news. Not everything is of, of importance, but there is a sense in which we try to understand what are the thrusts of what's happening in human history and what are the movements of human history and how do we understand that with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's where we have to make discernment. In fact, it is often through historical events that we discern God's hidden call to work according to his plan by active and effective involvement in the events of our time, that this is going to be something that we all have to pay close attention to. That, for instance, a good example would be Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Blessed Mother Teresa had a sense of listening to the situation in which she lived and paying attention to the importance of the poor. And as different wars developed, whether in Lebanon or in other places, she would send her sisters to minister to everybody and anyone. Not because she was on the side of any one uh, person fighting another, but because she wanted to serve everybody. And that was part of her mission. She would look to the events of the time and see how can I serve and how can my sisters serve. Discerning the signs of the times is what the Vatican Council affirms. And it must be done in the light of the gospel. That's what it says in God et Spes, paragraph 4. The church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. Thus, in language intelligible to each generation, she can respond to the perennial questions which men ask about this present life and the life to come about the relationship of the one to the other. In other words, what's the meaning of this life? Why is it so short? Why is eternity so long? What's the meaning of eternity? These are the questions that, that people still ask. They want to know why does somebody die so young? Senselessly, as happened the other day, when that little girl was shot, the judge was shot, and these other people were shot. You no, know, these things seem senseless. We have to under, try to understand, you know, what's going on and discern that. It is necessary, therefore, to be open to the inner promptings of the Holy Spirit, who invites us to understand in depth the designs of providence. The Holy Spirit will give us a way of looking at the world to see what is happening here and how do we understand it better. The Holy Spirit calls consecrated men and women to present new answers to the new problems of today's world. Problems that are very difficult and very challenging. Terrorism, violence, drug use, so many important issues. These are divine pleas which only souls accustomed to following God's will in everything can assimilate faithfully. Only if you want to follow the will of God will you be able to assimilate this and discern what God wants. And then, after you've assimilated this, then you translate it courageously into choices and action, which are consistent with the original charism of the order to which you belong, and which correspond to the demands of concrete historical situation. Because you can't just come up with an answer that is not appropriate to the present day problem. The present day problem needs an answer that's appropriate to itself. As you know, somebody says, you don't give an answer to a question somebody didn't ask. The modern world is asking questions and we have to be able to deal with it. And that's going to take discernment and the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to do so. 
And so, with that sense of trusting him, may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you and good night.